morning we are uh, finishing up our summer series through the book of Proverbs. And as you know, uh, Proverbs is kind of different than most books for preaching. You can't really take sections because that's not the way it's written. So you kind of take a topic and just hit a spray of different Proverbs all throughout. I felt like all summer I've been spraying you with a water hose of Proverbs, which should feel good in the summertime, I would think. But a book of ancient wisdom, 3,000-year-old wisdom that has stood the test of time, inspired by the Holy Spirit of God, and with much to teach us today. You know, in our modern society, we think because we are much more advanced technologically and scientifically, we kind of assume that we are also more advanced morally and in common sense. And that is proven more and more as we observe our age. That is not true at all. We are much more advanced technologically, but in, in wisdom, we have gone backwards maybe, I think, as we look at this ancient wisdom and see how it compares to the modern political correctness. But today we are looking at the family. That is the theme for today. What does this ancient wisdom have to say about the family? And as we know, the family is the basic unit of society. It always has been. And by the way, it is a major problem in our world and society today. The breakdown of the family unit is a serious, serious problem. Divorce, and not so much divorce. Divorce, by the way, <coughs> excuse me, is not increasing. Divorce is holding level, if not going down a bit. But what's increasing is just not getting married. And that's increasing all over the place. In fact, our society encourages it with its modern wisdom, saying marriage is an option. Career should be first, and your happiness should be first. And yeah, if you find somebody, that's all right. But don't do it until you get your career set, and you're ready to go, and everything is in line. And quite different from this ancient wisdom, where marriage was a given. We talked about that last week when we looked at Proverbs 31, the ideal woman, womanhood, and how it was assumed that you would be married. And so much today, you young people are being taught in our society that that's just an option for you. The reality is, that's a gift of God. And that his design was, when he made mankind, he made male and female and said, now from here on, you're getting together and becoming one flesh and leaving your father and mother. He established marriage. The Apostle Paul in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, and by the way, starting next week, we're beginning 1 Corinthians, and we'll be going through the book of 1 Corinthians the entire school year. Basically through May, we'll be in 1 Corinthians. So that's a preview of coming attractions. But in 1 Corinthians 7, they asked Paul, isn't it better to be celibate? I mean, isn't that more spiritual? And Paul answered, and uh, paraphrasing chapter 7, we'll be there in a month or two down the road. But what he said was, yeah, that's great if you're gifted that way, but because of immoralities, every man should have a wife and every woman should have a husband, and for crying out loud, don't deprive each other in that area sexually, because that's part of the gift of marriage, and if you're given the gift of singleness, then that is good, but that's a gift not to be tempted sexually. So marriage is, is, is seen as a norm in scripture, and you young people, I want to plant some seeds in your mind, if you want to think biblically, don't ignore thinking when you're young, getting married someday. What type of person would you like to marry? Prepare for that. It's the second biggest decision you'll ever made other than the decision to follow Jesus is who you will marry. And don't say if, unless you're, unless you're gifted by God in a unique way, you should be getting married. If not, you leave yourself sexually wide open to every temptation and sin that's out there. That's biblical talk. We're going to cover a little bit of that this morning as we look at the basic family. If you remember last week, we looked at Proverbs 31, and that proverb was not by Solomon, it was by... Lemuel, King Lemuel, but it was actually his mother. It was the proverb of King Lemuel's mother who instructed him in three things as a young king. Said, first of all, do not get bogged down with all these women out there, with, with womanizing, because a king back in those days could have any woman he wanted. Don't get involved with alcohol. Okay? Stay away from womanizing and drunkenness. And the third thing was find a good wife. And I think those, those first two spent about seven verses on them and like 20-some verses on find a good wife. So the, the advice of this ancient wisdom from the king's mother to the young king is the most important thing you can do in your life is find a good wife. So marriage is seen as the norm biblically. And you, you young people fit that into your mind because that's not exactly what you're being taught by our society. You're being taught, go for you and your career and all you can be. And if you happen to find somebody, that's beautiful. That's not biblical wisdom. That's, that's worldly wisdom. So we're going to start out in talking about the family, in talking about marriage. What, do, what does Proverbs have to say about marriage? 
the first place I'd like to look is Proverbs 2.17, which is kind of an interesting little verse. And if you, you didn't know the languages, you'd go right by this one. By the way, that's the value of having people who are pastors and preachers who have been trained. Uh, a lot of people are opposed to paid pastors and, and seminaries, a waste of time and things like that. But there really is value in having somebody who actually can go to the Greek and Hebrew and look at some of these things and is trained in that. That's, and here's one of those places. Verse 16 says, to deliver you from the strange woman, from the adulteress who flatters you with their words, so talking about marriage faithfulness, that leaves the companion of her youth and forgets the covenant with her God. That tells us two things. Marriage is a covenant not only between two people, with God as well. But this idea of companion that my, my translation is leaves the companion of your youth, verse 17, that word in the Hebrew means intimate friendship. Intimate friendship, intimacy is involved in that word. And so the first thing we see about marriage is it is designed as an intimate friendship. It kind of breaks apart the idea that in antiquity, marriage, the wife was just kind of chattel slavery. No, back in this 3,000 year old wisdom says marriages should be intimate. The person you are closest to in your life should be your spouse. If it's not that way, something's haywire somewhere. So. God calls us, even in this ancient wisdom, to have intimacy in marriage, that you would be very, very close friends. When God made Adam and Eve, he didn't just say, and, and get along with each other well. He said, become one flesh. Be absolutely bonded together to the point where you become one. How much more intimate can you get than that? So God's plan is for intimacy. Your best friend in the world should be your spouse or something is wired wrong in your life. The second thing we see is that marriage should involve ardent support. You should be absolutely a supporter of the other one in all things. Proverbs 18.22 says, He who finds a wife is finding a good thing and obtains favor from the Lord. You should see your spouse as a gift from God to you and appreciate and support that spouse in all those things. Uh, Proverbs 19.14 says, A prudent wife is from the Lord. And Proverbs 12.4 says, An excellent wife is a crown to her husband. Go back to Proverbs 31, where we were last week, talking about the, the ideal woman, which, of course, no one measures up to, but it's the ideal. That's what it's intended to be. Proverbs 31 says some interesting things with relation to husband. It's all about the wife, about the ideal wife, the perfect woman. But it says in verse 11, the heart of her husband trusts her. We're in 31, by the way, chapter 31 of Proverbs. The heart of her husband trusts her, and he will have no lack of gain. She will be a tremendous support to her husband. He can trust her, and she will help him to uh, succeed in life. And then if you go over to verse 23, it says, her husband is known in the gates when he sits among the elders of the land. In other words, he is highly respected, and that's all based on the support of his wife in this chapter. So what does this tell us about marriage? Your number one supporter in the world should be your spouse. We live in a world that can beat you down and chew you up pretty good. When you come home, should be the one place where you have someone who is 100% for you who is there to pick up the pieces and tell you how cool you are. Us guys especially need to hear that. That's, that's one thing that spouses should do. Uh, to be infinite friends and ardent supporters, and okay, here comes the good part, passionate lovers. The church fails in so many ways teaching sexuality. Do you want to know why we fail? Because we teach it by ignoring passages like Proverbs 5, 15 through 19, and to our young people, we say, oh, we don't talk about that. That's bad, 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 sex bad. Young people, sex bad. Don't even go there. Don't even talk about it. Don't even think about it. And then all of a sudden, when they're married, we say, okay, now it's all right. And we wonder why some people are so messed up in that area. Go to Proverbs chapter 5, beginning with verse 15. Now, this seems like it's talking about wells and water, but I'll give you a clue. It's not. Drink water from your own cistern and fresh water from your own well. Should your springs be dispersed abroad, streams of water in the streets, let them be yours alone, not for strangers with you. Let your fountain be blessed and rejoice in the wife of your youth as a loving hind and a graceful doe. Let her breast satisfy you at all times. Be exhilarated always in her love. Now, as soon as the teenage boys stop snickering, 
This is something we fail to teach. This is talking about married love. It says, let sexually, let one another satisfy the other. It says, be exhilarated, literally in the Hebrew, be intoxicated. There's two places in scripture, intoxication is okay. It always, intoxication with mind-altering substances is always condemned in scripture. Be intoxicated by the Holy Spirit and be intoxicated by the sexual love of your spouse. Young people, that's truth. Where we fail in teaching sexuality is that we, it's, it's such a beautiful thing. It's like a priceless Rembrandt painting. You don't take that and stick it between two sawhorses and clean fish on it. That's what happens when you exercise this wonderful, beautiful gift of sexuality outside of God's plan for marriage. It's cleaning fish on a Rembrandt. We should hold it up as something beautiful and to look forward to. And as a prime reason to get married, by the way. That's what the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians chapter 7, because of immoralities. Every woman should have a man, every man should have a woman, and do not deprive each other. And only if you do, if you abstain from that area, only for a short time by mutual agreement, then get back together for crying out loud. It's God's plan. It's God's gift. It's a beautiful and wonderful thing. It's something to look forward to. But don't clean fish on the Rembrandt. So what does this tell us? By the way, sometime before my uh, preaching career is over, I'm going to preach through Song of Solomon but I'm not quite ready yet. <laughs> Intimate friends, ardent supporters, passionate lovers is this ancient wisdom. It's God's plan for marriage. The next thing we see is a parenting team. A parenting team when it comes to children. Look at chapter 1, verses 8 and 9. Proverbs 1, 8 and 9. Hear, my son, your father's instruction. Do not forsake your mother's teaching. Did you catch that? The training and disciplining is not for one or the other. It's for both. This proverb teaches uh, over and over again a parenting team. Flip over to chapter 6. Just a few pages over. And verse 20. My son, observe the commandment of your father. Do not forsake the teaching of your mother. Important ancient principle. This is, by the way, Families that have a mother and a father, a male role model and a female role model that work in tandem and are a team are the ideal situation for children. That's where our society breaks it down so much. There's so many fatherless homes, so many strange mixed up homes with all kinds of, of uh, different components involved. In fact, modern philosophy says it's not even up to the parents. You raise a child by a village. In other words, don't worry about parenting parents. Let the village raise your child. Or let the public schools raise your child. And tell me, some of you out here are public school teachers. How much more difficult is it to teach these days than it was 15 years ago? Because you have to not only teach, you have to parent. Am I right, Connie? Every teacher I've ever talked to says, do you agree with that? I've never heard a teacher that doesn't agree with that, saying we have to do more than teaching. We have to actually parent these days because it isn't happening at home. The husband-wife team is crucial. It's God's ideal plan. It's ancient wisdom. It's not one or the other. That means a lot of things. That means you work together. You, you probably, husbands and wives, have different backgrounds. So there's usually a good cop, bad cop, right? A stricter one and a more lenient one. You see the, the mothers who are more protective tend to be more strict, and the fathers who are out, you know, learn the hard way out in the backyard are more saying, okay, let them learn some things. It, you got to work through those and be a team. That's the key to good parenting. Make sure that there's not a good cop, bad cop, because the kids will work that. They're, they're good at that. They know how to play that game. Make sure you're united. That means also, mom, if you're home with the kids all day and the father comes home and hasn't seen the kids all day, don't make him spend his time doing discipline every time. Got to work as a team in that one too. So, anyway, that's, that's the ancient wisdom for parents, for husband and wife. Intimate friends, ardent supporters, passionate lovers, and a parenting team. Now, there's kids involved here in families. What does this ancient wisdom have to say for parents and children? Well, parents, you are called, obviously, to teach your children. Look at chapter 4 of Proverbs. We actually get to go in a little passage here that's rare in Proverbs. Beginning with verse 1. Hear, O sons, the instruction of your father, and give attention that you may gain understanding. For I give you sound teaching. Do not abandon my instruction. When I was a son to my father, tender and the only son in the sight of my mother, 
Then he taught me and said to me, let your heart hold fast my words, keep my commandments and live, acquire wisdom, acquire understanding. Do not forget or turn away from the words of my mouth. Do not forsake her, for she will guard you. Love her and she will watch over you. Talking about wisdom here. From the beginning of wisdom is acquire wisdom. And with all your acquiring, get understanding. Prize her, she will exalt you. She will honor you if you embrace her. She will place on your head a garland of grace and she will present you with a crown of beauty. Parents are to teach wisdom, to teach kids how to make wise decisions in their life. That's a big part of parenting. Your goal is to teach your kids to make wise decisions. Secondly, what are you to teach your kids? Look at chapter 3, one chapter back. My son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. For the length of days and years of life and peace they will add to you. Do not let kindness and truth leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart so you will find favor and good repute in the sight of God and men. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make your path straight. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your body and refreshment to your bones. Honor the Lord from your wealth and from the first of all your produce. So your barns will be filled with plenty and your vats overflow with new wine. My son, do not reject the discipline of the Lord or loathe his reproof. For whom the Lord loves, he reproves, even as a father corrects the son in whom he delights. Teach godliness. Teach our kids to follow the Lord. Those are the two things that are emphasized here in Proverbs for parents teaching children. Wisdom how to make good decisions, and godliness, how to follow the Lord, how to give to the Lord, how to accept the Lord's instruction and discipline. So parents are to teach their children. They're also obviously to discipline their kids. Right, parents? This is part of the deal. Even though sometimes our society says, no, these kids get messed up by discipline. Just let them go and distract them and let them find their own way. And uh, that's a recipe for very lazy parenting and very spoiled kids. But as we look at some of these things for discipline, uh, chapter four, 13, verse 24 says, He who withholds a rod hates his son, but he who loves him disciplines him diligently. Proverbs 19, 18 says, Discipline your son while there is still time. The call to discipline a child is seen throughout that. Now, the rod is mentioned over and over again in Proverbs. Now, that is not very popular these days, and we don't recommend having a rod or beating kids. However, uh, a properly done spanking is not child abuse, even though our society says it is, but we must have ways of disciplining that are effective. Now, if you're a parent and have a lot of kids, you know that every kid needs to be disciplined differently. They're not the same. There are some kids, one stern look, and they are bubbling, crying, repentant. Other kids, no matter what you try to do, they will stick their jaw out and shake their fist and say, bring it on. Now, some of you parents are elbowing the proper kid right now, I think. <laughs> there are times where you have to find something that works. That's the job as a parent. Find something that's not abusive that works because you're doing a disservice to your child if you do not discipline them. The problem with our society is there's a, a philosophical belief that all people are born good and they're messed up by parents and society and things like that, which leads to the parenting principle of let them go, don't mess them up. Whereas the Bible tells us and the world around us backs up every time you take an honest look at it. We are born sinful and selfish, and we must be trained to do right and be good people. So that's the job of discipline. Why? Proverbs 22:15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of discipline will remove it far from him. Proverbs 29, 15. The rod and reproof give wisdom, but the child who gets his own way brings shame to his mother. So parents are called to teach their children wisdom, wise decision-making, and following the Lord, godliness, and they are also to discipline them in the way that works best for that child. Again, as a team. Remember that first one, as a team. And finally, they are to cherish them. Proverbs 17, 6 says, Grandchildren are a crown of old men, and the glory of sons is a father. That intergenerational value that kids have. Uh, Grandparents, tell me, what's the most precious thing in your life? Let's say it all in unison. Who? Grandkids. Grandkids. Yeah, it's obvious. Cherish them. Cherish them. Even in the difficult early years. That, that's really the call to parents. Teach them, discipline them, treasure them, or cherish them. So husbands and wives, what's this ancient wisdom say? You should be intimate friends 
You should be ardent supporters. You should be passionate lovers. And you should be a parenting team. In that parenting, teach them wisdom and godliness. Discipline them and treasure them. Now to kids. Uh, I don't have to say too much here because this is very clear and straightforward from the beginning to the end. You are called, first of all, to listen to your parents. Chapter 3, my son, do not forget my teaching, but let your heart keep my commandments. Chapter 4, verse 1, hear, O sons, the instruction of your father. Give attention that you may gain understanding. Chapter 5, my son, give attention to my wisdom. Incline your ear to understanding. I could go on and on and on. The biblical command for kids is, first of all, listen to your parents. They have more wisdom than you. Even you teenagers that think your parents are just total dorks. They have more wisdom than you. They were your age once. They lived through it. They can help you through it too. Their job isn't just to keep you from having fun. They know what they're doing for the most part. Obey your parents, obviously. That's the commandment. You honor your father and mother by obeying them. That it may go well with you. That you may live long on the earth. Why? Because, number one, God has put them in that place. They are there to do that. That's the right thing in the eyes of God. And secondly, they've been around the block a few times. They know what's at stake. And also, kids, learn to accept that discipline. It's not that they don't like you. It's not that they want to deprive you of having fun. If they're parenting well, there's always a good reason when they discipline you. Learn from it. Learn from it. You'll be a better person because of it. So that's what we have in this ancient wisdom for the family, for those husbands and wives, intimate friends, ardent supporters, passionate lovers, parenting team, for the parents of children, teach wisdom and godliness, discipline and treasure. For kids, listen, obey, and accept that discipline. There it is, 3,000-year-old wisdom that has stood the test of time and applies today as much as it ever has. And the way our families are going in our world and society, we need more solid families that listen to and practice wisdom in their marriages and in their families and between parents and children. We need it desperately. What's the best thing you can do to change this world in the future? Parents, raise kids who will be good people and Christ followers and God honorers. That's the best thing you can do to change this world. It's a missionary endeavor. And that's the wisdom of the Lord here. Let's pray.